and let me introduce myself. Hi, everyone. I'm Tara Cox. I'm at the National Girls Collaborative Project and also at SciStarter, and I am the director of the National Citizen and Community Science Library Network. It's nice to see some familiar faces and some new folks. Um, let us know where you're from in the chat, what organizations you represent. Um, we're curious if you're from libraries or other um, facilitator organizations. Also on the line with me, and you'll hear from both of them today, are Emma Giles and Caroline Nickerson, both at SciStarter. Um, and we're going to jump in. So we always start off with this, uh, what is citizen science? For those who may be new to the concept, um, Apologies if you've been on our webinars in the past and you see this over and over again, but it is a global movement that enables people, anybody, everybody, to be able to collaborate with real scientific research, with scientists. It is how people are making an impact about what they care about. It is not your average STEM programming. So that's a question that we often get from libraries and from other community-based organizations. How is citizen science different than what I'm doing already when it comes to STEM? And what makes it different is that it is about real scientific data collection and data analysis. Um, at SciStarter, which is where we are all um, at, we are a, a hub for citizen science. We collaborate with scientists. We collaborate with, with you all to make that data collection accessible, possible, and to provide you all with the resources to be able to support your communities to become citizen scientists. So there's tons of projects. We're going to talk about some of them today. We're going to talk about what Citizen Science Month is, but if, you know, we have a lot of um, different resources to get familiar with what citizen science is, but that's sort of the key takeaway. Citizen science is about real data collection and analysis in collaboration with scientists all over the world. And Caroline put a link in the chat to one project, uh, I See Change, which is all about looking around your environment. You can be a citizen scientist every day um, by, by, you know, tracking your local environmental conditions. Um, so let me pass it to Caroline to tell us about Citizen Science Month. Yes. Hello, everybody. I couldn't help myself. Y'all were putting weather observations in the chat and I was like, you know what? You could submit those and those observations could turn into real data that researchers could use to understand the world. So why not? Um, okay. But first, so Citizen Science Month, welcome everybody. Um, it's not this month. I, people always get confused when we're talking about Citizen Science Month super early. It's April. It happens every April. We're doing this so you all have enough time to prepare. Uh, but it's a month-long celebration of citizen and community science. Runs all April long. And it features thousands of events hosted by librarians, library staff, community organizations, and folks all around the world. Um, yes, and we know libraries like lots of lead time, which is why we're doing this in December. So you can get everything you need. Uh, but I'm curious. I know some people um, make it an annual event. Others of you may be using Citizen Science Month for the first time to jumpstart a whole year of citizen science in your library. So let's take this poll. Have you hosted a Citizen Science Month event before? Let's uh, let, you know, make your voice heard. And it's okay if you haven't. We're going to tell you everything you need to know to get started. And if you have, you know, awesome. We're going to give you more resources and maybe help you step up your game a little bit. Um, it's just so, a, a really way to introduce was... to this your library. Yes, I was just going to say, Emma, put a link in the chat to a Mentimeter poll. So that's, um, you, you can put it in, in the chat as well. But we're going to, um, Emma, do you want to share your screen? Sure, yes. I will just swap it over. And then you'll get to see everyone else's responses in real time. We got a lot Woo! of new people on the line. Whoop. Zero yeses. Oh I'm going to put in, in the... <laughs> We're so excited you're here. <laughs> in the chat again so that you see uh, where we're at with these polls. All right, one yes. If you've never used Mentimeter, it's a really good tool. So we like to always model good good uh, data collection tools as well. We encourage you to use it. For the two people who have hosted or participated in Citizen Science Month before, let us know in the chat what you did. I'm just curious. I think one of them is Darlene. So she's skewing our data a little bit. Hee hee. Uh -oh. <laughs> Darlene is the founder of SciStarter, so I, I could see that I'm going to make you a co-host too, Darlene, so that you can come on camera. Um, and uh, yeah, let us know what you did. All right, let me go back to, it's good to know that 
that folks um, have not hosted before because that's what we're all here to do today. So uh, Caroline, tell us a little bit about where Citizen Science Month comes from. Yeah, well, originally it was a day. Um, so Citizen Science Month was a day and then we got feedback from awesome library staff like you all and they said, hey, we want more. So we expanded it all to a whole month. Um, and we're very lucky. We have some great partners that help make Citizen Science Month possible and help us um, create resources that you all can leverage in your programming to galvanize some collective impact around citizen science. So SciStarter, I'm with SciStarter. Um, SciStarter.org is the world's biggest citizen science um, database, website, organization, partners with Arizona State University. So Darlene, our founder, she's a professor of practice at ASU, and they're a big part of Citizen Science Month. We also have the All of Us Engagement Partners. I'll tell you more about them in a second. Public Libraries, the Network of the National Library of Medicine, All of Us Program Center, and more. Uh, I, I wanted to kick things off with a quick thank you to the Network of the National Library of Medicine and an LM All of Us Program Center, um, because this organ, this partnership, um, that the NAPC for short, um, they um, help make Citizen Science Month possible in terms of producing resources for the All of Us Research Program, um, which is an opportunity that you can um, bring to your library if you want to help advance health research in a really big way. But they also support all... Um, our team to um, provide support to you all for other citizen science projects and other ways that um, you can jumpstart science in your library. So we'll go to the next slide and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what all of us is. So before we play this, oh, oh yeah, I was just going to say, I didn't share my sound, so I have to reshare um, the uh, slide so that I can, sh my sound is activated too. You know, the good old Zoom trick. Okay. Zoom. Yes, this video does a really good job um, explaining the all of us. And um, I, I want to give it the framing that like, I think in many of you, if you're, I think most folks calling in are based in the States, if I remember right. Um, if you're anywhere in the U S you can bring all of us to your library and you can use their turnkey resources. And that could be one of your featured projects for citizen science month. If you want to have people do surveys and donate samples uh, to help move health research forward and have it include everybody, they're going to show you that in a second. Um, but if you go to our website, citizensciencemonth.org, you'll see lots of all of us resources. Like if you see this video and you're tantalized and you're like, wait, what is this thing? There's help. We also have a slide about event support awards. That I'll explain in a second. You can get up to $5,000 from our partners, um, the NAPC. Um, you can use it to advance your collections. You can use it for staff time. You can use it for, um, you know, an event itself to help feature all of us in your library, the Citizen Science Month. So that's why we wanted to kick it off. They're such a great partner to us. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just let Tara uh, play the video and you'll learn a little bit more. Meet Ray. Ray lives on a farm. He loves playing kickball with his grandkids, but lately he's gotten a little slower and been visiting the doctor a lot more often. This is Kim. Kim lives in the city. She loves to exercise, cook healthy, meals and can't remember the last time she called in sick. They're both people, but not all people are the same. And yet, when we visit the doctor, our treatments don't look that different. Why is that? Because we just don't have enough information to do it better until now. Enter all of us. The research program based on precision medicine. Precision medicine is a revolutionary new approach to treating and preventing disease that's personalized instead of one size fits all. By gathering health data from one million people like Ray and Kim and Trevor and Samir, our country's best researchers will be able to develop treatments that are as unique and complex as we are. With this new information, doctors will have a better understanding of disease so they can innovate the next great breakthroughs in medicine. Once enough people join, suddenly everything changes. Information becomes clear, patterns emerge, and simple data transforms into to life-saving knowledge. This means that Ray and Kim's children and their children's children can live longer, healthier lives. By becoming one of the first one million people to volunteer, you can help reshape the entire future of healthcare for generations to come. If we can figure out how to fly, put a man on the moon, and connect the entire world, Surely we should be able to improve the future of healthcare, not just for Ray and Kim or even you, but for all of us. Sign up at joinallofus.org. The future of health begins with you. All right, we'll go to the next slide.
Whoops. All good. Cook me out. But yeah, um, I personally brought all of us to a number of different libraries before. So if you go to the next slide. Meet Ray. <laughs> I just want to go to the next slide. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so here, here I am. You can see me wearing a blue hat, which I'm actually, I'm wearing the same hat right now. Um, this was earlier this year. So the last Citizen Science Month, April, 2023, I went to the Sacramento Public Library um, and I presented, um, they got an event support um, award from NAPC. So they used it to increase their collections and for this particular event to support it and do promos and um, pay for staff time and all that good stuff. And we featured all of us. So we talked about how people at the library could, um, you know, contribute um, bio samples. So um, blood, for example, or just fill out those surveys. You can do just the surveys if that's what you're comfortable with. But we talked about how folks can contribute to all of us to make medicine more representative. And we also talked about um, how they can explore the data with all of us and understand more about their own health, which I, I thought was a really cool event. I think why I also wanted to highlight this event. So this was one of our featured citizen science opportunities. You know, it um, prompted communities to um, be meaningfully engaged in important health research. We also did a project that you'll hear about a little bit later called Stall Catchers, which is a separate project where people watch videos of mouse brains and classify them for researchers so they can better understand Alzheimer's disease. So you're actually making those data annotations and classifications. You're doing the science, which is so cool. Um, so what you're going to hear in this webinar, we've been calling them recipe cards. I, I'm thinking of this webinar as like a buffet. Um, you're going to be able to figure out how you want to build out your Citizen Science Month buffet and meaningfully involve your community in real scientific research they can do. So I'm going to pass the mic back to my colleagues so you can get some of these recipe cards. And uh, we'll just keep this restaurant metaphor going. You can put together your menu for Citizen Science Month this year. Oh, it's me. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot I was the next. Sorry. Um, Emma and I had switched back and forth to see who was doing this section, but I it was it was me. So uh, the rest of this webinar, we really want to help you prepare, plan and participate um, in Citizen Science Month and think about what um, all of the resources that we have available and how, how to utilize them. Um, so we want to first think about prepare. So many some of you have already done a lot of these things, but we just wanted to showcase them again in case that um, you haven't or especially your staff. I mean, these are all really good training resources to build your capacity around the foundations of citizen science, what it means to become a library as a community hub for citizen science. So we have these online training tutorials. We'll put those links in the chat. If you haven't completed them, we really encourage you to do so. You can get a badge, um, put it on LinkedIn, and um, and really build your capacity. It's a great way, too, for your public. This These tutorials are for anyone, so if um, you can... You can promote them to other folks as well. We also have webinars like this one. Um, Emma hosts a weekly live event. Uh, and Emma, I think you have to put the HTTP with it when you put the link in. Yeah, I can do. Sorry about that. No, that's all right. It's, it's an annoying Zoom feature. We need Zoom to, to know what we're trying to do when we put the links in. Um, <clears throat> Emma hosts a weekly live event, which is great. Does a deep dive on... Um, projects. And uh, we also have these webinars for libraries as well. And we're going to talk about some additional webinars specifically for Citizen Science Month planning that we have. And then we have a ton of resources. We have event guides. We're going to go into some of those right now. Um, we have building a uh, kit building guides. Uh, if you want to host a kit with resources to support different citizen science projects, we have facilitator slides for you all to use that you can use when you host events. So um, check out those resources on uh, scistarter.org forward slash library. Oops. I went too fast. We also encourage you um, to prepare your library users for citizen science. Um, there are different ways that we uh, and different resources that we've developed that are really in support of your uh, library users. There are some great posters, some flyers, book uh, marks, rack cards. We have um, some interactive posters that you can put out. Here's some examples of of that in action here. Um, Waldorf Public Library did a book, dis uh, did a display all about citizen science using our resources. We also have um, book clubs for citizen science, just different sort of passive programming or um, like less of a high lift as far as um, developing a program goes. You can really, you can really um, 
you know, tag along some of these resources into already existing STEM programming and already existing book clubs, affinity groups. And we really encourage you to just first bring awareness around citizen science, spark interest. Um, and then during the month of April, go that one step further and host an event and program to uh, support your library users to contribute and contribute those data points, as Caroline was saying. Just another quick mention for the trainings here um, and those facilitator guides and that slide deck that we encourage you. It's turnkey. It's adaptable. You can pull them off of the web and, and um, you know, adapt them for your different audiences to really introduce them to citizen science. What are some other ways? I'm curious if you have started to introduce citizen science with your communities. What are some other ways that you've done that? Feel free to put those ideas in the chat. All right, I'm gonna pass it over back to Emma to give you a tour of citizenscienceMonth.org and talk about our event recipe cards. Awesome, yes. And I'm going to hijack the screen share briefly because we'll start with just a brief overview of what the uh, website has for you. Um, and just know that uh, it'll continue to get even better too as we define which resources mean the most to you. So um, keep that in mind, we love your feedback. Um, I will. Hijacking. There we go. <laughs> um, as people actually people are adding some things in the chat too, which is awesome. I'm glad that we have other examples. I do anytime I do a program about birds, I encourage them to continue the learning at home with eBird. I love that. Also, Laura, you can use Merlin Bird if they're looking for more informational uh, knowledge about the bird species too. Community College Library, talking with student clubs, great idea. And professors, they love to use those for actual assignments too. So professors would be a great, great resource for uh, expanding the audience, right? Um, Tara, working with teens who are interested in earning volunteer hours, absolutely. Um, if they're uh, account holders on SciStarter, we can actually help them out by uh, giving them a uh, a good idea of what their contribution is, so you can find out how many hours they work. Um, so it's also very, uh, uh, very specifically a resource to support those who are getting volunteer hours. So um, excellent examples. If you have more, go ahead and add them in the um, chat. We're going to get into uh, more of the, to keep with the restaurant metaphor, the, the meal, the main course uh, of the entire uh, webinar, where we're going to talk about the event resources in the page for Citizen Science Month. So uh, if you have a chance to go on to citizenscienceMonth.org, it'll redirect you to a site starter slash Citizen Science Month. So you can use either. Um, we have a ton of things on here for you to just peruse in your own time. If you're interested in being a part of Citizen Science Month, we highly recommend going and signing up um, on this one homepage, which we'll actually cover again in a minute here. I'm going to take most of our time to head over to event resources to show you where you can find all the wonderful things uh, that Tara showed you and a couple more things that I'll get into um, and show you specific examples as well. So. If you're looking to get started, this is our uh, planning for Citizen Science Month webinar from last year. We'll be adding this one uh, right after this, too. And we have specifically uh, a list of helpful resources and kind of starting points for you uh, to get started and think about what you really want to do. So uh, it goes from training and learning the basics uh, and using um, our project finder to just kind of explore all the way to uh, planning an event and promoting it. So I'll show you a couple examples of these, but the event recipe cards is our biggest new um, hefty resource for you and we'll give you a few examples uh, but we also have a youtube channel we've got um, suggestions for subject matter experts to be engaged in your uh, events as well as many many more uh, free and customizable resources so and i'll show you this uh, website in particular so if you were to head here we've got everything from uh, event planner and facilitator resources specifically promotional materials social media assets logos you don't have to be logged in for any of this um, all you need to do is be able to download them so very helpful there um, and then we give you advice on registering your events so that we can help you promote it as well and signing up for the 1 million access science, which again, we'll mention in a few minutes here. So if you ever are looking for resources and want to know what we have to then uh, edit and customize based on what your library needs are, this is a great starting point for you here. Um, I'm going to head back to the slide deck. Um, Tara, would you mind sharing that one more time? Excellent. Okay. Um, and any questions about the website, too, that you might have, you can send them uh, to us in the chat so I can cover those as I move along. Uh, next slide, please. Excellent. Okay, so the event recipe cards that are mentioned on there are a really big deal because we've gotten a lot of feedback about how to really 
uh, tangibly plan an event and execute it in a way that makes sense for citizen science. So we built some. Uh, we built some event. It's like an event in a box type of uh, feature where we have a specific project. In this case, it's iNaturalist, which also connects to the Exploring Biodiversity Library Kit. If you're at a library that has um, those citizen science kits, this is directly related. Uh, so we give you some background to understand exactly what you're doing. Uh, we can tell you the age group that it's appropriate for, the timing and location of this event. Um, and just to note, in a lot of these, it's a uh, you can do the background and talk about the context of the project in inside and maybe go outside for the event, depending on if it's an indoor or outside um, project. In preparation, we give you advice on what to have in advance, especially if you want to add um, uh, optional materials that can help you. Um, you can do this without the kit. Um, all of these projects are available without the kits. It's just that some of the kits have some really nice um, resources for you that make it even easier. So if you do have kits, awesome. If you don't, also awesome. You can do it without. Um, so these materials, these are our optional materials. The only thing you really need for this one are the smartphones or a camera. Um, so the one on our website will have the listed as optional related materials too. Go ahead and skip to the next slide. I, I want, it just want to mention one thing. I know that I forget now who in the chat said they did a bio blitz. Um, I, I, I think it was Tara. Um, if you've done a bio blitz or a, an event using the iNatural, oops, I'm not on camera. Here I am. <laughs> if you've done an event um, using the iNaturalist app, oh, like a bio blitz, we really want to hear from you. So please um, add that to the chat or even unmute yourself to talk about your experience with this. So. Just wanted to, to mention that, Emma. Yeah, absolutely. And on that same note, um, so you can do this without the kit um, and look through ways to set the stage about biodiversity and learn about what um, what organisms are out there in your local area so that you can help prepare people for going outside and collecting that data. Um, but on the take action side, uh, for those of you who have done bio blitzes, uh, this is a really awesome opportunity to do a really high energy and exciting event. Um, there is a particular one at the end of April called the City Nature Challenge. Uh, that's a big deal. So if you're in a city, it's there have been 400 cities last year uh, who participated. So likelihood is pretty decently high that your city might be on there. So you can go onto the City Nature Challenge website to figure out if it's already uh, inducted and you can take part in that uh, in a bio blitz in that way, which is a global um, opportunity to do a bio blitz. And I see messages, so I'm just going to double check. Yeah, used it for uh, our events last April. And I believe you said you did City Nature Challenge too, Tara. So that's really exciting. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, it was really fun. Yay. Oh, thanks for unmuting for that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great experience. Did you work with um, youth or was it adults or both? Um, it was both. So I'm a teen librarian. So um, of course I had like my core group of teens that were helping me. Um, mm -hmm. But we partnered with the San Diego Natural History Museum for uh, several bio blitzes. Um, and they provide these nice little like um, pamphlets that explain how to use iNaturalist and then we're on site to help people learn how to use iNaturalist too and just like encourage people to explore our natural areas within our small city um, and hopefully you know record data there. That is excellent. I was actually in San Diego at their uh, Natural History Museum and they have an entire expose on citizen science. I hope it's still up anyway but it's yeah they I, I love that. I'm glad that you were able to partner with them. It's awesome. Yeah they're a really good partner for that. Excellent. Um, go ahead and skip to the next slide, please. Excellent. Okay, so for any of you who are thinking, oh, I'm here for Eclipse things, I want to do an Eclipse program. Awesome. I'm super excited for you because there are many options for you to choose from. Uh, in this case, we added a recipe card for the project Eclipse Soundscapes, specifically Observer. Um, and we also have, there are other uh, protocols beyond Observer. If you're a data collector, for example, it requires you um, to apply for a um, uh, an audio moth device. So you can, you can uh, engage in other ways that are either more intense or just educational too, like the apprentice role. Um, I chose the Observer role for this recipe card because it's the easiest to do in an event setting uh, because it can be a one, one instance training beforehand, do the event, debrief afterwards. Uh, so in this case, the observer role for Eclipse Soundscapes is all about understanding the question, how does life on Earth, especially wildlife, uh, respond to eclipses? And so participants will observe during the eclipse and then submit their observations uh, on its essentially animal behavior. You could even make observations about um, like the temperature changes. It's meant to be a very multi-sensory experience. And so as a part of the training, you can go in, uh, 
go in and talk to people about what it means to have a multi-sensory observation um, event um, and what that looks like for each person. And this is a really great one for all ages too, because you can you don't have to be any particular age to feel different senses uh, in your environment. Uh, and the only different or the only uh, caveat to that is if you're submitting the data later, which we really encourage you to do so to make it citizen science, um, that would need an adult's help to submit that data, right? Um, so it can be in and out of the in or out of the path of totality as well. You can be anywhere, especially in North America, because that's where the eclipse is, and there will be partial all across the country. All that is available to you, very inclusive to all. Preparation wise, um, they do have a project protocol and there's a 15 to 30 minute training. Um, it's pretty short, so you could do it um, as a full training for anyone who's involved in the project, like uh, prepare them as well as prepare yourself by going through the training with them or suggest they do it um, otherwise, um, or do a different version of it that covers all the basics uh, prior to the observation time. Uh, there are materials like the observation worksheet that guides you through what that multi-sensory experience should feel like and, or what not what it should feel like, but ways in which you can find uh, your different descriptions of what you feel on a, uh, on a different sense basis. And you can also have eclipse glasses to actually see the eclipse. We recommend that as well. Uh, go ahead and skip to that next slide, please. Awesome. So here's another one of those uh, pages where it's the set the stage, the collect the data, the take action, the three parts of a, of a core event. And so for setting the stage, it involves having people set up their SciStarter accounts, um, which is optional to participate in this, but you do get credit through um, the Eclipse soundscape. So we highly recommend it. Um, we also would like to direct everyone to that, uh, that SciStarter page to find out the protocols for it and get pushed onto their uh, the Eclipse Soundscapes website for more resources there. Um, so a lot of just setting the stage of like, what are we actually learning about? You can also find a lot of um, information on how to explain um, eclipses, solar eclipses to your uh, your participants as well. For collecting data, I mentioned a bit of this in the previous, so I'll be brief here, but essentially having a practice round of seeing what you can experience during an eclipse before the eclipse kind of sets the stage for what things will be different and what things to note as well. Uh, you can pass out fresh uh, observation data sheets to have people ready to write it. You can also do this with uh, verbal observations. So if you wanted to have recorders of some sort or have people set up uh, the, the app on their phone to record their voices during this time, this is what makes it especially um, accessible to all people if you don't have access to a certain sense um, like sight. So I'm um, curious if anybody was in the path of totality. I, I put that in the chat. Yeah, I was curious to know that. And just one one thing to note about this project is that, um, and just with the eclipse in general, we know that libraries are such a big partner during the eclipse. Um, and we really find that citizen science is a great way to boost your eclipse programming. So, you know, the eclipse happens, what, a couple of um a couple of minutes, maybe an hour or so while people are out there, this is a great way to build some additional context about why this matters, um, why observing the eclipse is such an important, um, important thing and community, you know, driven science initiative. Sorry, go ahead, Emma. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree with everything you said. Um, after an event like this, just adding on to that, boosting it in terms of like what you personally learned, you're not just viewing it, you're really taking part in real science. You can debrief with everyone about what experiences they had. They differ across um, different people. And what does that mean for the science? What do you think we'll learn? Uh, and so you can have a really strong conversation after the fact. So beyond just seeing the awesome celestial event, you can really kind of ground uh, your participants in something real and uh, feel good about submitting observations, which Again, um, afterwards, if you want to submit those observations in a computer lab, if you have access to one, or you can encourage people to um, submit their observations at home by providing like a little half sheet that just has directions for how to submit those observations. So all good things um, that can be done during Eclipse Day to make it even more exciting, right? Um, and if you are on the path, there are many other uh, projects that especially apply to you. Um, and we didn't mention all of them here, but we do have uh, did have an event on boosting your uh, your Eclipse programming with Citizen Science. You can go back to our webinar for that one as well. And Tara just dropped the link for SciStarter.org slash Eclipse, which has all the projects that relate to the Eclipse. Um, and we hope you take a look to see which ones uh, make the most sense for you. Go ahead and uh, go to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, this is the last one we'll show you as an example um, event, uh, but there there are more on that uh, link to a Google Drive with a list of them. Um, the event recipe card link on the citizensciencemonth.org slash event resources. So for a catchathon, a stall catcher's catchathon, 
um, is a big event in which you have a bunch of people come together and essentially play a video game and you get to uh, score it. So the video game has a leaderboard. You get to see how people move around. You can even have a unique lead leaderboard for your team of people um, and have them compete against each other and set a goal. Uh, and it's a really excellent way to just add a lot of nice to do with teenagers especially because a they're they're really good at it because they're relatively impulsive um, and that's really good for uh, stall catchers but it's also because it's a video game and so it's really it's conducive to bringing people into the uh, citizen science fold in a way that's accessible and something that you want to do um, as a teenager so uh, would highly recommend it's also great for all ages really so adults are uh, just as good they're just less impulsive and overthink things like myself so um, this is a great one, especially uh, so in preparation for it, I would recommend you go and um, check out the page on SciStarter.org and create an account so you can practice the game. You can also create a team from your account specifically and for your event. And then uh, if you wanted to, you can contact us or you can contact the Stallcatchers uh, friends at info at Stallcatchers.org to inquire about making a personalized leaderboard. Um, and that would allow you to have one, a big one up that's just based on the people who are with you in the room for the event and showing off their super awesome skills and amount of hours of work they've done, which in 20 minutes, you could complete two hours of research, uh, research essentially, because if you have a bunch of people, that's more than one lab tech uh, doing that research. So it's really exciting to see just that number just get bigger and bigger. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Oh, and Tara just mentioned it's really great in the uh, in the winter months, too. So if any of you want to test out a Citizen Science Month project, this is a great one because it's when it's cold outside or snowing or whatnot and you want some uh, some events happening. Uh, it's really easy to set this one up. Yeah. Um, so for the set the stage for this one, um, introducing citizen science in general is a really solid plan um, and defining what Alzheimer's disease is. Depending on who you're working with, you just might have a bit of a, um, a knowledge gap there. And so it would be great to have uh, a discussion on that prior to testing it out. Um, you can use informational videos from stallcatchers.com, which are super helpful. They're short, easy to digest, and give you instructions on how to play the game too, so it prepares them. And then we also have talking points for you uh, to get you started. So if you're ever unsure of how to phrase something or how to best describe the project, um, we've done this one so many times, we wanna give you a ton of resources to make it happen. Um, to collect data, in this case, it's annotating data. So instead of collecting things first off, um, you're annotating data that exists already for um, this project. So you're gonna be looking at videos of mouse brains uh, that are scanned for seeing uh, changes in blood flow in the brain. Um, so it'll be stalled as in like a vessel blocked or flowing as in the blood is flowing normally and nothing is wrong. And so you guide people in creating an account and getting set up, looking at a tour um, for the game to understand how the game functions. And then you have tutorial videos to practice that, that skill of seeing is it stalled or flowing, hence the name stall catchers. And then uh, if you wanted to, you could share that leaderboard on the screen, like I mentioned, uh, so they can see how well everyone is doing and compete against each other during the actual event. So super fun. And then uh, that last part, take action. You can review the results of that leaderboard. It's also a great idea to just have a debrief about what this is really accomplishing for Alzheimer's disease. If you need more words on that, um, we have our talking points and we can also um, advise with other resources as well for you. So um, it's a great project, would highly recommend. Um, Caroline and I both work with this one extensively. Caroline, do you wanna add anything else about stall catchers that you find most important or? I think the coolest thing about them is they um, will often cite the catchers as co-authors in scientific papers. I don't know if that's cool to everybody, but I think like it's a great if, if, if you ever have a, a person at your library ask you, you know, is this real science? Like, is anyone using this? You can say yes. And like, you know, for example, uh, the stall catchers project, when they publish in the top scientific journals, the citizen scientists who work with them are co-authors. So y'all are making a real meaningful difference by doing this project. Absolutely, great thing to add. Yeah, if you ever want your name on a, um, the Stallcatchers contributors are listed anyway, so you are in that mix. <laughs> Unless you get very involved and then there you go, they might name you. <laughs> uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. 
Excellent. Okay. So on the website, when I showed you, if you were to scroll down a little bit farther, I might've shown this, um, this area, actually the add and promote your event, um, registering your event just means going to scistarter.org slash add dash event. So we can help you promote. And so it's a, it's a big deal to be able to have a big calendar of events. And we really love seeing what everyone is doing. And so beyond helping promote, um, you, you get to see what a bigger picture you're a part of. And so once you have an event planned, add it, to our site and we will assist, we will reach out if, uh, if needed to um, support you as well. Um, and then on the, uh, oh, on the side of promoting your event as well, I, I noted some of the resources that are listed there, but there's a, gonna be a big button that says, um, access all the free and customizable resources. And it, it's already listed there so you can see it as well. Go ahead into the next slide, please. Awesome, all right, before I will we get Yeah, I was gonna say before we get into, to the the new campaign, which we are excited to tell you all about. I wanted to just stop and see if there was any questions about those three events that we talked about, the Bio Blitz, um, iNaturalist event, the Eclipse Focus Soundscapes event, or the Saw Catchers event. And those are just three example types. As Emma said, we have different, um, these recipe cards, there's even more. There's one on pollinators, there's one on measuring light in the night, so... There is a question in the chat that mm -hmm. I want to read out loud just so we can answer that one because it's, uh, is that stalk, uh, is stalk just ongoing? Great question. Yes. It is ongoing. It will continue to be ongoing for a long time. Um, can it be done in April? Absolutely. Uh, where do we find the timelines for each thing? I'm not sure how to answer that question. When you say timelines, are you referring to like the start and end of a project or Tara, do you know? I, well, I was, um, I mean, feel free to unmute yourself, Jessica, and let us know. But I was, I'm thinking, well, the 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 projects that we promote at SciStarter are all ones that, for the for the for the most part, that we know are are active projects. Um, so all of these are still um, open to data collection and data analysis. Um, is that what you meant, Jessica? Great. And d I, did you want to just quickly show affiliates, Emma? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's a great idea. I, uh, so the, we just feature three event types. We're going to keep writing recipe cards as long as they're helpful to you all. Um, and, you know, there's thousands and thousands of projects on SciStarter. Um, some of them are we work more closely with, um, and these are our affiliate projects. So um, if you don't know where to start, you know, you feel free to go on and search for projects and there's some local projects right in your backyard there's global projects that you can do from anywhere um but this this page is a good page as a to 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 start your journey and and look for some um these are pretty popular projects they include apps they include um there's ones that are are you can do via just a computer like like stall catchers some some great examples are um there's ones that um are looking at trap cameras. Um, go ahead, Emma. You're. I'm talking. Emma knows more about this than me, so I'm just going to pass it over to Emma. <laughs> You said all the good things, though. Um, I would agree with everything you're saying. There's a bunch of different versions of things. These are just the um, the ones that have extra tracking cap capabilities so that we can um, stay in touch with these projects and also allow you to get contributions easily. Um, a great many of them are fully online. So if you're looking for fully online ones, it's easy to find a bunch um, and a bunch of them are outside. So like Project Squirrel, walking outside to look at squirrels and then you go online afterwards to count them all up. So all the above. Yeah, there's a ton of different ones, though, if you wanted to look for specific words in here, um, and even more service oriented ones. One of my favorites in particular is Project Sidewalk, um, where you're helping identify uh, pedestrian pathway accessibility issues. Um, and that's a Which, really wonderful In one. Philadelphia, <laughs> the bad. entire city should be on Project Sidewalk. Now that mm -hmm. I have a, a little baby walking around with the stroller, um, it's like treacherous everywhere I go. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and the other one too, I was just talking to a group of librarians in the uh, Virginia Beach area, and there's some great um, ocean-based projects, Marine Debris Tracker, and some other ones that are are really great as well. So again, I think we we always encourage you all before even starting to plan an event is talk to your community and see what they're interested in. There's projects from health oriented to you know e ecology and environmental based. Um, lots of animal projects. Who doesn't love an animal? Um, there and then obviously all of the astronomy and NASA related projects. There's there is a citizen science project for everyone. Um, and so we've just shared a couple of examples and a couple of event types and really that model of 
of um, setting the stage, collecting data, and taking action can be applied across all of these projects. And you know, you're there's no one better than than you all to develop programs. It's what you do every single day. So we're here to support you to develop a program around any project um, that you find interesting. That's what we're here for. So um, I'm gonna pass it now to Darlene to tell us about the 1 million acts of science campaign, which are, are very, very exciting. Uh, 20 new, new, but I think we're probably gonna do this forever and ever because this is such a great campaign. So go ahead, Darlene. Yes, especially if we hit the goal of 1 million acts of right. science. Hi everyone, nice to see and you. And it'll be 2 start. million. And it'll be 2 million. <laughs> and I totally agree with you with the, um, curb cutouts here in Philadelphia. And I remember those days of the strollers. Tough. Tough. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Darlene Cavalier with SciStarter. Nice to see and Arizona State University. Thanks for having me here. Um, the 1 Million Acts of Science is a new campaign that we're adding on to Citizen Science Month. And the idea here is that we will find a way to tally and um, count at least 1 million acts. That could be a data contribution to a project that could be analyzing some of the data that you heard about from stall catchers. That could be attending an event too. So we're being a little bit um, loose about the terms of how to define 1, 1 million acts of science. Ideally, we'd like to see the um, adding data to a project or analyzing data that's part of a project. And you've heard about different event ideas where you can maybe get a lot of people together to engage in projects that they care about and events that align with your capacities too. Um, it is a global effort. Uh, I don't see any reason why we're not going to hit this number. Um, so one of the things that is also different about this is that this is a way for pro more projects to get behind Citizen Science Month. It's a way for them to kind of re-stimulate their own participants to uh, get involved in the collective action. Who doesn't want to be part of something so cool? And at the end of the day, we really hope to be able to move fo um, research forward faster by having so many people involved in Citizen Science Month. So um, it's a little bit of an extra step this year while we try to figure out a better way to account for all of this. And, and that would be that on the Citizen Science Month webpage, and maybe Tara or um, Emma can bring that up, on the Citizen Science Month webpage under, it's either about or participate, you'll see four different options to sign up to be part of the 1 million acts of science. Um, and so what we do, and I don't know if you can share that, Emma, thank you. Um, and so what we do here is if you're an event planner or project leader, there's one box to participate. Um, it might be participate, it could be, there it is. So if you're an individual, not affiliated with an event, you wanna sign up. The reason why we're doing that is so that everybody who signs up right after Citizen Science Month will send an email asking for you know generally how many acts were um, committed during that time. And then every organization or every person that participates too will get um, an, an electronic certificate that they can print out. Um, organizations, people who want to be listed on the website, projects, and so forth, they also will be listed on the website as being part of this initiative. So, um, and I'm just reading some of these. Yes, definitely. No, and one of the reasons why we do want people to sign up here, even if you don't choose a project that's on SciStarter, um, because what you're doing there with the neighborhood forest is really important. Um, I, I'd like to count that towards the 1 million X. And so by signing up, it allows me to, it allows us to get a hold of you and you know have some level of accountability. Otherwise, we're, it's just a big guess, guessing game and we don't know who did what. So I encourage people to sign up for any one of these four categories. It's a very simple sign up form. It just says, yes, I'm interested. Um, yes, I wanna be you know listed on your website and here's how you can connect with me afterwards so that I can tell you how many acts were performed. Anything else I should add here, Tara or Emma? Or Caroline? I was just going to have you list, a, I mean, maybe people don't have questions, but we, we did skip over this slide, which is what is an act of science. I think you all hosting an event is also, are we considering that an act of science as well? I think so. Yeah. This me is too. where I think it's okay to be a little bit loose. I, like I mentioned, I don't think we're not going to hit the number of 1 million actual acts that advance scientific research. 
but all of these other support structures that make it possible for people to learn about and actually do citizen science, they ought to be counted for something. So I do think they should count. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. And like Darlene said, we right now we're just asking you to sign up so that we can um, get in touch with you. And then we'll probably be asking some more specific questions, you know, at the end as we're counting things like what did you do? And then we can categorize things into post an event, contributed data. Da, 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 da. Um, so I just put that link. Does that did that link to the right thing? Yes. So that is for libraries. So if you're planning on hosting an event, Please sign up there and then we'll be able to get in touch with you afterwards. Um, and then check out the, the citizensciencemonth.org page for the other options. Um, yeah, we are very excited and we love our new beautiful um, logo. And you'll see more about the One Million Acts of Science campaign as we head into the new year and um, roll out communication, more, you know, additional communication around Citizen Science Month. Uh, we wanted to we wanted to um, have some time for questions, but before that, we have some event support awards that we want to give to you all. Um, and Caroline's going to tell you how to be able to receive those. Um, we please come and talk to us because we want to help you get these these funds. Yes. All right, and we'll go to the next slide. Yeah, so basically you can receive if you um, are interested in that all of us project I told you all earlier about. Um, if you think that health research will really resonate with your community, or maybe you want to do this health research project and an environmental project, for example, or if you just want all of us in some way to be part of your Citizen Science Month April programming, you can be eligible for up to $5,000 of an event support award from the NAPC, that organization I told you all about. Um, ideally, you'll be close to um, one of the all of us organizations, like they call them health provider um, organizations. Um, that being said, for example, in Pennsylvania, um, they operate across the state, so we can find you something. So that's why I just streamline things. Um, if you are interested, we'd like you to come to our office hours next week. That's December 18th um, at 4 p.m. Eastern. Or just email us, because if you want to do this, we'd like to walk you through the process and coach you up a little bit to make sure your effort is as successful as possible. I think this is a great opportunity um, to um, move health research forward in a meaningful way and bring citizen science to your library. Um, and if you need those funds for collection, staff time, event costs, and more, um, this, this could be a really good opportunity for you. And, applic and like uh, Tara says in the chat, applications are not a heavy lift. So just get in touch with us. Let's chat, let's brainstorm, and let's do something great together. Thanks, Caroline. I just asked Emma to put the link to the office hours in the chat, but we can't find the link so we're good we're finding the link for the office hours we will send it in a follow-up email tomorrow I, is it in um check the calendar invite uh emma i think it might be there yes it probably is That's a good okay <laughs> uh yeah so come to that and just ask your questions the application we're not public we're not doing a broad um dissemination of the application it's really we just want to know if you're interested and we will help you um uh, fill complete that application and there's a good chance you'll get the funds um so please uh come and talk to us about that or send us an email we can hop on one-on-one -on -one with you to next week um the following week we're all out of the office i and these are due by the end of we didn't put this but these are due by the end of uh, january so there is some time to apply for these uh yep there's the office hours registration we also are hosting uh, event facilitator meetups in January, February, and March to help you plan your events. So we'll send those as well, links to those as well. Um, and yes, come to come on Valentine's Day on February 14th, and uh, we'll help you with your Citizen Science Month event. This is your Citizen Science Month team. So we are all in and ready to support you in any way we can. Plus there's others behind the scenes too. Uh, before we end, where are the, oh, here we go. I didn't want to go to thank you yet. We're not, we're not, we're not ready for there. We have a couple of additional questions for you all just so that we can better understand how to support you in the next few months as you're planning for Citizen Science Month. So Emma's going to throw those uh, Mentimeter polls up again. And this is a great time as well if you have questions for us. Um, so Emma, do you want to share? Go ahead. You can go ahead and take over sure. the screen. 
I do want to note um, if you have ideas of how you'll participate, that would be a great thing to add in the chat as well. Um, and then I'll share my screen for the questions that are um, waiting for your answers. There's also a QR code if any of you are sitting on a desktop and have a phone in your hand. Um, the first question is what projects and topics are you most interested in? Um, this will help us understand if we need to add more resources or where to support um, and highlight more resources too. So number one, wildlife. <laughs> Love it. Uh, feel free to add more than one as well. Uh, if you have interest in the stall catchers, Alzheimer's uh, disease projects or uh, climate change related projects, outdoors, absolutely. Even noting like what type of audiences you're looking to support. So uh, adults, youth, multi-generational, any of the above, stall catch thon yay. Awesome. Ooh, light pollution eclipse pollinator. Love it. I'm surprised it took long, that long for Eclipse to get up there. I thought people were going to say astronomy from the get-go. Ooh, and look how pretty. There are no, yes, no climate love. changes yet. <laughs> Nobody wants to address climate change. That's okay, Ooh, though. Environmental stewardship. That counts under climate change, I think. Yeah, there's a project about cleaning up litter and qualifying or quantifying each type of litter so that we can understand how to better prevent certain types of litter. Um, Pollinators, too. Obvious. I think that's climate change-related for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we, there is a pollinators event recipe card and there is a light pollution event recipe card. So yeah, we'll guide you to all of those. I'm going to events are super popular um, with okay. libraries and because they're just, they're fun. Bees and butterflies are awesome. Absolutely. I didn't realize until I had a, now have a one-year-old how much I think about bees and butterflies every day. Every single book that's all we read about is bees and butterflies. So <laughs> I think it's a great youth focused project too. <laughs> Ooh, what was the new one that got added? Uh, maybe not. Okay. Native um, species? Can... No. Eclipse. I think Eclipse got bigger. Just got bigger. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eclipse projects. We've got you covered. We've got multiple. Imani has a great question. We have been planning for the All of Us project for some time as well as urban heat islands. Um. Our 2024 focus is on environmental justice. How do we get started? Wonderful. Amani, let us know where you are um, and we can help connect you to all of us folks. Casey, oh, okay. And in, in terms of getting started with urban heat islands and environmental justice, I think the best thing is just to start doing a project and then you can scaffold out your programming from there. So we've had some success in the past. We did this project called Wicked Hot Boston where we worked with folks to do the IC change project in Boston to map urban heat. And then we added a bunch of complementary efforts to the IC change project to help get at that urban heat islands with our other partners. Um, so my advice, um, Amani, is just to start with a project like IC change and build it out from there. And with all of us, you know, email us, we'll figure out the HPO nearest to you. We'll help you apply for that event support award, all that good stuff. And um, also when you come to the office hours next week, you and I can break off after and um, we can talk a little bit about um, some environmental justice support ideas as well. Cause like Tara said, like, um, you know, thinking about like building your, your stuff, your programming based on where you are is really important. Um, but my advice as well is just to start with a project like I see change. Wonderful. Um, contacted Spelman, Superman Spellman, more like Superwoman. Ha ha. Um, yes, that's great. And, and Monty, please come to that event support, uh, or, or schedule a one-on-one -on -one with us to talk about those, um, the, uh, the grants. We are looking for people to apply. Also another comment about Eclipse related things. Um, Todd, can you tell me where you, are you in the path for April? You can type or you can unmute if you'd like to just trying to figure out where people are across the path if they are. Dot, 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 or not. <laughs> Wonderful, Tara says, we're looking to host a community science expo in April if any community science project leaders on here would like to participate at our event in Southern California, reach out. Thank you. Atlanta, okay. Awesome, Todd. Um, this is really good news. Okay, cool, good to know. <laughs> 90% coverage. You're going to have some really great views. That's awesome. Cool. Um, there is one, one more. Yes, one more poll. Go ahead. Uh, so this is about materials. So based on what we've said today, we're curious how you feel about um, some of the resources we've provided on your uh, phone or whatever device you're using for this one. You'll have to just click all of them and kind of reorganize them or click 
click on each one in the order of importance. The options are the promotional materials like posters and flyers, facilitator event recipe cards that we uh, showed you three of, stall catchers, iNaturalist, and um, Eclipse Soundscapes, training courses on scistory.org slash training, event support awards of uh, $5,000, up to $5,000 when working with the um, All of Us project, citizen science kits, um, if you think that is particularly important uh, and likely for you to use, event support meetings, they're once a month in the next coming months, January, February, March, and then our social media toolkit, which we did not show you today, but we're curious how you feel about um, what you need in order to get started so we can provide that to you. Um, I'm guessing one person. Oh, there we go. Ooh, interesting. This is, Yay, I've never done this part. kind of poll, Emma. I like this. Yeah. I love it. It's called a ranking, if anyone is curious. Yeah, I love it, this one. And it's super fun. Ooh, so it's like it's, I feel like I should I'm, be doing like race I'm work. glad we went with Mentimeter today, Emma, because the Zoom polls are pretty dry compared to this. Yeah, they're boring. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Zoom. <laughs> we'll still use it. Uh, this is great to know. Okay. Event support meetings. Oh, you're going to leave us alone in there? <laughs> Probably. We'll be there anyway. So join us just to chat. <laughs> Share your thoughts. Excellent. Okay. I'm glad the event recipe cards are really high up there. So um, we're excited to share yes. more of those with you and have them front and center on that page for you. Um, so you'll be very easily able to use it. Excellent. Ooh, kits. <laughs> Competition. <laughs> Excellent. All right. You yes, and, and if you don't know, um, I was just going to say, I know we only have, only have two minutes left, but if you are interested on how to build one of those citizen science kits, we do have webinars on that um, and those resources. So we don't provide kits, but we have all of these. They're sort of like the recipe cards, but even in more detail um, on how to build citizen science kits that folks can check out with specialized tools. And those are at citizenscience.org forward slash library dash build dash uh, dash kit so check that out awesome thank you all so much uh we will follow up tomorrow with an email and we hope that you add your events you come talk to us and come to those event support meetings or schedule one-on-one -on -one time to talk with us um, as always you can email library network at scistarter.org uh or any of us we are here to support you thank you everyone I'll go ahead and stop my share. If anyone is interested in having this conversation a second time to just get more clarity once you've had some time to think too, we have a, a part two of sorts for this in, in January. I'll drop the registration link for that in the chat right now as well. Bye, y'all. Bye.